I was asked to Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, April 28th, 2015 Finance Committee meeting. With us this evening, committee members present, Councillor Kushmerick, Clark, President Hay, Councillor Tran, and myself, Councillor Dinatali, also present this evening, Councillors Bezal and Boschman. We will start with 81-15, an order that the City of Fitchburg accepts the gift of up to 250000 from Unitil Fitchburg Gas and Electric Light Company and allow the expenditure of funds from the gift for the reconstruction of various city streets. Commissioner Laxo. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, in the past few years, we've been working closely with uh, <laughs> Unitil's gas personnel to coordinate our paving work with their uh, gas main replacement projects. And uh, last year, they replaced a lot of gas mains in the combined sewer su separation area, mainly in uh, Ward 6. And uh, rather than require Unitil to put in a a, a permanent pavement patch and then dig it up the next year when we uh, repave those streets from curb to curb. Um, we allow them to put in a temporary patch and uh, they pay us the uh, the cost difference and we contribute that towards um, paving the street. So um, those credits added up to uh, $197,882 from last year so they'll be um, paying that to us this year and then we have uh, similar situations that might come up during the year so we're allowing for a total of uh, $250,000 in Unitil contributions towards paving. And uh, we've been considering them uh, gift accounts just for uh, accounting purposes. And that way we can uh, spend <coughs> the money on paving out of those uh, gift accounts. Council Kushmerick. Uh, Commissioner Lack, so th this, this seems to make a lot of sense as a, you know, seems like an efficient way of collaborating with Unitil on, on projects like this. Uh, my only issue is, it's as, uh, it, it's twice listed here as a, as a gift. And I, when I think gift, I think you know charitable contribution. Um, so my only concern there is, it sounds like this is this is work or, or funds that they have to use for us, you know, in some way, shape, or form. So this isn't, um, you know, this is kind of an exchange of goods and services between the two entities. So uh, can I clarify? This is not a you know, this is not a charitable contribution on their part, that this is, in fact, you know, just another form of, of repayment? Yes, that's correct. Okay. President Hay. Yeah, hi, Lenny. Um, I'm assuming this is a win-win, um, but who, get, who gets the bigger win here? Um, really, it benefits everybody. I mean, the main benefit for UNITO is that um, they're not responsible for the life of the uh, patch. I mean, if it were just a pavement patch, they're responsible for the quality of that patch forever. If it falls apart, they have to fix it. But once we pave the street, they're off the hook. So, so that's a benefit to them. Realistically, their biggest benefit is that they're, they're buying an exemption from their responsibility for, for the patches that they would put in. Yeah, that is a big benefit to them. So if... If they don't, if they only put a temporary patch in, and ultimately we take this money and we pave the street, and there's a, a problem with it later on uh, because of something that they dug up underneath, expands or moves or, or does something in, in the road, um, needs repair, the city's responsible for that then? Uh, I mean, I think we take that on a case by case basis. I mean, if we can demonstrate that it was, you know, due to their their lack of good workmanship, we might be able to get them to make the repair. It just depends on the circumstances. Okay, and thirdly, $250,000 lengthwise of, of pavement, how much does that get us? Uh, that would be about a half a mile. And how many patches um, are they exempt from doing in, in regard to this? Any idea? Yeah, I mean, there were, they did lots of gas main replacement works in, in their services also, you know, going to individual <laughs> households, so there's we, a lot we, of them. Do we have a formula that we use to come up with this 200000 by X amount of dollars times each patch, or are the patches different sizes, so they yeah, I mean, track it differently? <clears throat> yeah, we measured out the length of the, uh, of the patch work and, you know, just multiply that by the, you know, by the width and the thickness of the pavement to come up with the... Uh, a cost. Okay. Thank you. Council Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Lenny, um, the uh, 
the two hundred fifty thousand, or the and the accepting of the gift. How long has that been going on? It hasn't been that long, has it? That we've um, received this gift. Yeah, maybe five years or so. Is that okay? Um, I, I just it, it seems like it's about five years. Mr. Yeah, Sanderson, how's it? Yeah, when this idea came up, uh, uh, we did approach the uh, city solicitor. And uh, we were advised this was an, a, an acceptable way to go about uh, collaborating with UNITIL on this and, and also with the water and wastewater enterprise funds. It's a good joint effort to, to tackle the, the streets efficiently. Thank you. Councilor Tran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lenny, why doesn't the $250,000 go into a paving account and not a gift account? Um, it's, it's really the same thing. It, Maybe Dick can explain what a better way it's called a gift account, but we do use that money for paving. It, because it's coming not within the budget, it's a separate fund, special revenue fund, so it's restricted uh, <coughs> for that use. As as uh, when you approve these, you usually say for the purposes. Okay. Uh, and and here it actually specifies the purpose. Okay, that's great. Reconstruction of various city streets. That's that, that's my concern that there's a restriction yes. to this gift and. Um, is this is there a contract behind accepting this gift with Unitel? Um, I'm going to piggyback on, on President Hayes' concern. Is that once we accept this, uh, does it free Unitel from any liability uh, on the work that they've already performed? Yeah, I mean basically because it it's no longer a trench patch, but a, a fully paved street. Um, they're, not, they're not responsible anymore. Is that something that we should pay a higher emphasis on, a, a, a larger concern on this, um, and ask for uh, some kind of a um, contract uh, between the city and Unitel before accepting it as a gift? Um, what what do you think should be in the contract? That the work that they are already performed, if if we if the city um, engages in any future work and we f and we find that the uh, work that they performed were inadequate and that it requires more city funding and more city. Um, um, resources to fix their problems, um, is that something that we can hold them accountable for? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a fair point. I'll bring that up with Unitil and see if we can come up with some language that covers it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Boschman. Lenny, on this gift, or whatever you want to call it, how you want to call it. Let me ask you a question. So I want to make sure I understand. Well, and I'm going to use my one, not Councilor Andrew <coughs> Beeswell, because that's where most of the highlights were on the map that I have. They're digging up St. Andrew Street to put a high-pressure line in. And they're going up Teresa Street. Now, let's assume, let's assume that all of a sudden, we're going to, by the grace of God, we're going to pave St. Andrew and we're going to pave Teresa Street. Now, after they passed it, something happened that we have to go back and we got to pave it. Are they all done with fixing those holes that they dug up? Because we just paved the whole street over. Are they done? Do they don't have to go back? Is, is this what I might, I want to know. If, do they have to go back if it starts to dip? In that particular, where we think the area was, because we have no cool now, because we just resurfaced the whole street. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you know, we'd have to take that on a case by case basis, and if we can, you know, prove that it's that it's their fault, you know, we'd have to go back to them. You know, that would get to the language that uh, Councilor Tran suggested. So we'll yeah. we'll come up with something uh, and approach Unitil with it. All right. Commissioner, the, when, when the work is done and the, <coughs> the patchwork is done, and then we get this money to repave the whole area, 
during the pulverizing or the repaving process, wouldn't that be where the engineers would see something wrong in the work that was done? Or if, I guess my question is, when Unitil does their work, is there not some city official who's supervising the work or ensuring that what they done is up to satisfaction with the city? Or do they, are they by themselves when they do this and when they walk away from the job, there's no city review of the work that they did. Anybody from your office, like I know when the water department does work, or there's there's a private company putting in a water line, there is water department supervision there of some sort, or they check the work to make sure it was done satisfactorily. Does that happen with us, with, with, with in these cases? I mean, we usually don't have people there watching Unitil backfill the hole and make sure that they compact it. I mean, we do inspect the uh, the surface of the patch, and if it starts to settle then uh, you know we make them fix it um, but but we're not there watching them. we just don't have enough people but have you run into any instances where we've had issues with this in the past Unitil has done the work we've paved something and something would happen have we had any issues like this are they frequent are they infrequent I mean in general Unitil does a pretty good job uh, <clears throat> they have a, a private contractor who does most of it for them and Unitil has its own inspectors to make sure that their contractor is doing it right so that Unitil doesn't have to go fix it mm -hmm. later. Um, but there are other contractors out there that don't do a good job and that's why we're in the process of strengthening our trench patch requirements which will include an ordinance change that we'll be proposing to you uh, shortly. But in the, in, in the past, in any instance where we've had an issue with Unitil's work, we haven't had any issues with them remedying the situation if in yeah. fact the facts brought to light indicated that it was their their fault that the that that that, that, that had happened have they they haven't given us any problems in the past no whenever there's an issue they're always uh, good for uh, taking care of it okay president hey uh, two things uh, just honey it says here um, reconstruction of various city streets does that go simply to the streets where they have dug up and put the temporary patches, or do we use this on other streets that we might determine need it more? No, the intent is to um, apply their contribution to the streets that, that they, that they yeah. worked on. And the second thing this, is? This is just a little different because that there were so many, there's a long list of streets that they worked on last year. And um, the other piece is, I'm glad that you're going to be putting something forward legislation to increase their responsibilities for, for fixing patches and putting them in. And I don't know the, the logistics of it. I know it has to do with pressure and pounds and footage and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, there are other towns that have much higher standards than Fitchburg does. Um, you have people whose argument is, is, well, you know, then companies won't want to do work in Fitchburg if we make the standards higher um, because it takes them longer and, and, and it has more cost. I don't care. Make the standards high, make them tough, and make them do it right. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Bezo. Uh, thank you, Councilor D'Antale. I actually have a question for Mr. Saracen. Would it be better off instead of calling this a gift account to be, to call it a reimbursement? That's the, the tricky part of the law. It's got to be a gift or a grant. So um, that's why we, we name it, a, we t treat it as a gift. Okay. And uh, second ca question, uh, Ms. Lasco. <coughs> so let's say we said to Unitil, we don't want you 250000 We just want you to do patch it. And they said, fine. So they go and patch it. And then we go and repave it. We're responsible once we pull up the patch anyways for the condition of that road, right? So in other words, I guess by us accepting this, it's kind of helping us out in a way. Um, it's really not letting them off the hook because we would have taken them off the hook anyways if we dug their patch up and repaved over it, right? Yeah, that's true. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll look into that that point. Uh, you know, if the if the area does start to settle due to something that they didn't do properly, uh, you know, how we can hold them responsible. Okay. Councilor Clark. I'm also Mr. Chair. Thank you. Move 8115 be adopted. Second. Motion made seconded to adopt 8115. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Those unanimous. <coughs>
82-15 in order, transfer 28,000 DPW streetlights from accounts as follows, 7,000 from DPW highway general expenses, and 21,000 from DPW municipal garage expenses. Mr. Laxo. Yeah, I'm projecting a deficit of about $28,000 in the streetlight account this year for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, there were uh, rate increases by both Unitilly and Direct Energy that didn't come to light until um, after the fiscal year 15 budget was already passed. And also we've been uh, counting on savings from the LED light conversion project, but um, you know, that was supposed to happen by December 15th, but um, didn't happen due to several different delays. So, um, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't see those savings this year. Um, it could have been worse because uh, I'd also expected that we would be paying lease payments uh, every month for uh, the streetlights, which would have been about $55,000 in fiscal year 15, but the way the lease was structured, we are only paying once per fiscal year, and that won't happen until uh, next September, so we didn't have any uh, regular payments due yet. Uh, so that, uh, yeah, that did save us $55,000 this year. President Hay. Yeah, Lenny, you, you said that one of the reasons for this was the LED light um, situation. Um, are we doing the LED light in this year's budget? Is that factored in, and will we get them in so we'll have that, or will we have the same situation next year? No. Um, I'm expecting that the uh, LED street lights will be installed this summer. We already have the lights on hand. Um, those were delivered on uh, March 5th, uh, so they're being stored at Putnam Place. Um, what we've been waiting for is the controls. The, you know, the controls are the, uh, <coughs> the photo cells on top of the street lights. Which are uh, <coughs> which are uh, smart photo cells so that we can network all of the different street lights and take advantage of dimming capabilities and things like that. But those those were delayed because of production problems uh, on the part of the manufacturer. So we changed manufacturers, and uh, you know we'll, we'll be receiving the the controls in the next uh, month or two. The installation of the LEDs and all the other components is that being done by the DPW? staff no we've hired a uh, a contractor to oh do okay because i was i was hoping that that wasn't put on you guys and used as part of the calculation for showing us what savings we were getting out of this and not putting that in okay thank you mm -hmm. council Tran. thank you mr chairman just a quick question for the uh, commissioner is it costing the city anything with the contracting firm because of the de uh, delays um no, they, they've been holding their price on that. Okay, so there's no hard date for them to begin installing and that they're charging us uh, at, that, at that date? Well, their, their contract deadline, deadline is uh, July 31st to install all of the lights. I don't think they'll be able to make that just because of the delay in receiving the, the product. But, you know, they told me just this afternoon that they, they'll do what they can to get everything installed before the end of July that they can. It might extend later, but they haven't um, asked for any additional funds because of that. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Vote 82.15 be adopted. Second. second. Motion made and seconded to adopt 082.15. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? It is unanimous. Councilors will skip 3515 for the moment and go to uh, the discussion item. Discussion overview with finance team on the status of city revenue and expense accounts for fiscal year 2015. Councilors, I've asked the finance team before us this evening. I usually have them before us at least once a year, usually before the next budget rounds, sometimes twice, just to give the council or the committee some kind of an overview of where we stand currently on it fiscal year 15 we have about we have two months left in the fiscal year so we're 10 months into it so i just wanted the, these gentlemen to give us an overview and uh, positives and negatives for fy 15 close where we stand with revenue collection expenses and anything we should be on the watch out for or anything that we should be happy about not happy about so uh, with that, I'll start with Mr. Saracen. We have yep. Ms. Uh, Dick Saracen, City Auditor, uh, Calvin Brooks, City Treasurer, Ken Wilson, uh, City Assessor. Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Just to uh, 
uh, summarize. Uh, what we did was we, uh, Calvin, Ken, and I, we, we looked at the status of accounts. Uh, you've been provided a um, the mayor's uh, budget as submitted, the preliminary numbers. We figured we'd use the same schedules. Uh, and we're, we're doing okay this year. And what we were going to do was uh, just summarize the highlights some provide you with some of the highlights on the revenue side and also on the expenditure side so I think uh, we're going to start off with taxation sure we're going to take a look at first off at the uh, the proposed uh, the draft budget fis uh, fiscal 2016 and just start down from the top going down and there's going to be a little bit of jumping back and forth between where we are in 15 and the the, the proposed uh, or the draft 16 budget so Basically, if you're looking at the top, we start with uh, last year's levy limit, add 2.5% to that. To that, we add new growth. In this particular case, the estimate of 500,000 amounts to um, about 15 new homes and um, you know three or four small commercial type um, improvements. And the vast majority of it comes from personal property, um, primarily um, Unitil. Um, so that adding those three up you get to the levy limit for this year and taking away from that our normal reserve for abatements 950,000 and then you see a subtotal of what uh, we'll raise one of, uh, one of the components within taxation this year uh, is is uh, tax title which I think uh, Calvin was gonna we had a good year uh, regarding yeah, that. We've, we've been doing well with uh, collections. Uh, personal property real estate taxes account for about 42% of the uh, general fund revenue. And our collection rate is about 99% on that, which means that only about 1% of the taxpayers are delinquent and we have to place liens on their property or do a tax taking. Uh, currently, I, there are uh, over just over 600 parcels in tax title and those uh, show amounts owed of just over $5 million. Uh, that's kind of high, and, and uh, I've been making an effort to try and uh, get that number down and begin to, to make some serious efforts to collect or foreclose on those liens. Right now, there are 62 parcels in land court where we're trying to foreclose on the tax liens we have, take possession of the property. Uh, 36 parcels I have payment agreements on, there are more than 100 vacant parcels, land of low value, meaning they have an assessed value less than 20,000. Uh, that's a process we can work through the Department of Revenue on to, to expedite <laughs> foreclosure. Uh, there are about 30 parcels I have right now with the Department of Revenue trying to get their approval on it. And as you may recall, in January, uh, we did a tax lien auction. <coughs> And that's where we auction off the liens themselves to a third party. And the third party is the, the uh, organization that, that collects or forecloses on the property. Uh, in that auction, we sold 29 liens uh, and collected $270,000 for that. <coughs> the taxes due. Uh, my intention is to next review parcels taken in fiscal, fiscal years 9, 10, and 11 to see whether we send some of those to land court or can get payment agreements, those kinds of things. Uh, this summer, I plan to uh, do an additional tax lien auction focusing on the takings we did for the fiscal year 2013. I do want to say I appreciate the City Council's support for uh, creating the Side Yard Sales Program, which will be a way we have of disposing of uh, vacant parcels that we begin to foreclose on and, and take possession and I'm starting to work on reviewing the process with other department heads and will be coming probably to the council uh, for managing and disposing parcels that have buildings on them buildings that may be vacant or buildings that may be occupied uh, I would say that the city's you know I say to people that the city's not interested in taking possession of property we'd rather have the tax revenue but sometimes that's the only course we have. It will take several years to bring the tax title balance down to where it should be. And in bringing it down, I think it'll benefit not just the city's financials because we'll be bring, bringing in 
additional revenue that's been just hanging out there uncollected. I think it'll also help the neighborhoods because we'll be turning over property that currently has absent, uninterested, or underfinanced owners and trying to get them to owners that, that can do something with the property and thereby improve the neighborhoods. So it's, a, it's going to be a few years of work, but, but I'm hopeful that we can move on that. Okay, so the, the next area deals with state aid. There's three categories. Excuse uh, me, uh, yes. I have a question on taxation, what you just talked about. Uh, the 2.5% increase, I'm gathering that this is not helping our tax levy ceiling collision. Is that a fair statement? Raising it another two and a half percent. What is um, the assessor? This is probably from Mr. Wilson. Uh, the assessor's office has repeatedly warned the council of a potential <coughs> tax levy collision within five to ten years, given valuations and growth rates. The 1.040 million in new growth. It, that's a blip on the radar screen. Is that correct? Is that Great Wolf? That's, that's a couple of factors, but Great Wolf primarily. Is that something that we're going to see? I know we're not projecting that next year, but is, is that a one-time bump for us, or is that something that will be recurring now that they're in place? Uh, it, that's a one-time bump until, I think, uh, some number of years out, we start being able to pull in some more growth from it. So the tax base right now, I believe, is 15% commercial out of the 100%. This 2.5% increase in the tax levy, does this next round improve our tax levy ceiling collision potential possibility at all? Or Because I'm gathering that this is keeping us on the same path as where we've been before and we're, we're getting closer because our growth is not, or our valuations are not going up right. to the so point. So the primary, we looked at, we've done a preliminary analysis of, of uh, what's going to happen in fiscal 2016 as far as values go and we're seeing um, minor increases in residential and minor increases in commercial and industrial so to the extent that the values aren't going up at two and a half percent adding two and a half percent does have a tendency to keep us on the same course that we're on so what's minor mean is minor less than two and a half percent yeah one uh, one or two percent so let's say it's one and a half. So we're raising the levy by two and a half, but we're only getting growth valuation of maybe one and a half. So it would have to be at least the same level of growth in the in the valuations compared to the tax levy increase for us to not move in our position. All things being equal, yes. So would it be safe to say that this, if it's one and a half percent growth versus two and a half percent increase in the levy, we're not going in the right direction? That's a, that's fair. Well, if you're talking primarily about the the levy ceiling and levy limit collision, how many years do we anticipate, given the rate, the 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 value? I know it, I know it's a projection, but what's the latest on if things stay the way they are? How many years do we have left? If we keep raising two and a half percent, yeah, judging and the valuations from valuations stay kind of yeah. flatlined like they have been. I don't have that in front of me, but going from memory, I think it was uh, ten year, nine or ten years. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on taxation? Okay, moving on. Uh, the next category is state aid. Uh, uh, there's three categories that involve state aid. The first one is the um, MSBA, that's the Mass School Building Authority reimbursements. Uh, it's about $2 million. And these are old. This is an old program where, where we would borrow the money and the state would reimburse us 80% or thereabouts. Uh, these receipts are going to um, end the final uh, year for this program for the City of Fitchburg is fiscal year 2019 and that that aligns with the payment of the new high school. So the net effect is uh, our debt actually uh, is going to go down. Um, so it's a fortunately when we when we uh, built the school and, and issued the bonds 15 years ago, we did align the, the reimbursement with the uh, debt payments. So now what happens is uh, with M Mass School Building Authority, now what happens when we, when we uh, have a project, which we've done a few uh, recently, uh, the state actually pays the 80% up front, so we don't have to borrow. We only borrow <coughs> our share. All right? 
Uh, the next uh, the next two categories, uh, state aid for education and state aid general, these mirror the cherry sheets. The cherry sheets are uh, a name given to state aid and, and there's also a, a page that shows assessments. Um, for the most part, these mirror the, uh, the actual cherry sheets uh, for, for FY15 uh, and then there's been a slight increase from FY15 um, the net amount, if down below, is 2.7 million. It went up to 2.9 million. A couple hundred thousand has been the only increase uh, that we're projecting for next year. Um, that, uh, for now, that's it, it. It deals with the lottery money, or we call it unrestricted general government aid, uh, in various. Uh, uh, payments the state makes us. The Chapter 70 money is is in the school education uh, aid and other payments. Mr. Saracen, are these yeah. state figures based on just what are these based on? The governor's budget? The uh, yes, yes. So these would obviously change they, once the House and Senate. Correct. There's been minor changes, not on the major items like Chapter 70 hasn't changed yet. Unrestricted governmental aid hasn't changed. Okay. Um, the next page deals with our local receipts. Uh, we have a little more control over these. And uh, right now, our, our, uh, based on our projection, we projected 7.8 million. If you see that number, the subtotal for local receipts. And uh, we're requesting, we're increasing it a couple hundred, uh, I'm sorry, 400,000 to about 8.2 million. And uh, just to summarize a couple of these accounts, where we are this year, and uh, most are on target. Uh, one positive is the room tax. Um, as a result of uh, positive activity <coughs> at Great Wolf, uh, we're, we're, we're going to far exceed the, uh, the estimate of 610,000. We only projected uh, conservatively 262,000. So that'll be a positive uh, revenue item uh, for our year end close, uh, which will help our available funds. And uh, Saracen, that's a four percent tax that we assess. Yes. On that, on that note, because that's clearly the issue, the item that's driving that whole section, is the Great Wolf room tax revenue increases. Yep. We anticipated that last year that we were going to get a substantial bump. Yep. I believe. I don't recall if the committee voted in favor of this or passed a recommendation, but I believe the committee, and the council wanted to, earmark any funds above revenue projections to the OPEB account. Um, and this budget or the proposal doesn't put any such money into it. Instead, we're taking that added revenue and we're spending it. Correct. Is that a correct assessment? Yep. Yeah, I think there was a petition that was signed. Uh, and, and we will have a little more to say about that. As so, we, so the council's but, recommendation was ignored, essentially? Well, I don't, I don't think so. I think uh, Typically, as we're planning to do this year, uh, I think it'll probably be uh, as a supplemental appropriation out of available out of available funds. To what account? To uh, OPEP, OPEP trust. Okay. If that's decided by the mayor and the council, you know, in the fall or, or the later. Concern I have for that is that may not happen. It, it could it, that that could right. not ha that may not happen. Right. Now I know we don't have any authority to. <laughs> Administration to earmark funds for a certain purpose, but this revenue account is not a stable account. It could go less, it could go more, depending on the market and everything. So I just want everybody to be clear that when we had these discussions months ago about this account and what it can generate in revenue, to have it earmarked specifically for OPEB without even going through the whole supplemental process, because things could change in a couple of months where that request may never come. Um, it's a little little frustrating for me to, to see that we're basing a budget on an account that exceeded our projections and therefore we're going to spend it. Um, we shouldn't be spending that money. That money is not guaranteed every year. And given the liabilities that we have that are unfunded, I guess, I guess my concern is there's no guarantee we're going to get that kind of a request year after year. I wish there was some safeguard in place that we could just automatically earmark it to that account and not have to worry about it. But unfortunately, as we were told before, we don't have that authority. Um, but I know that was a bone of contention with some counselors about what do we do with that added revenue. It seems to be, in, in 
a high level of this that the added revenue we've received we're now using to balance the budget which means we're spending it which is not what we thought was best practice um, do you right. do you find that to be best practice mr. Saracen uh, well the you got to consider the whole uh, picture and uh, for example uh, we're, we're it's very difficult to meet that school spending and I'll we'll talk about that in a minute um, and um, there's so many factors that are mandated uh, that it, it's very difficult to balance the budget without without that revenue and um, I'm just using that as one of the examples uh, I'm using that as the, the no, example because it's, it's what drove that whole section is that one account well there's, that, a, that there's a couple others if I just to sure. touch on the yep. trash um, we budgeted uh, 1.440 1 1.4 million and uh, we're, we're already projecting at least 1.6 million for this fiscal year fiscal year 15 and we're budgeting the same for next year uh, Steve Curry did mention that uh, um, they have been able to do uh, some expansion uh, it's called the Benef beneficial use program it involves use of certain soils at the landfill uh, the other thing is the Barry landfill uh, has closed so we've we've uh, realized some of the dumping has come to our to our uh, our uh, landfill and we get royalties and that's that's helped us in that account um, another account that uh, positive is uh, licenses and permits um, what we have seen other uh, recently other developments that have realized uh, uh, permitting fees there's a mill project it's on Main Street but it's off of River Street uh, and then there's a CVS that was uh, recently uh, disclosed that that's going to be coming up uh, on North Street in Maine and then a couple dealerships have done uh, uh, some uh, improvements uh, and we've had a few new homes so that's going to help us uh, even the mill is good we got a we got building permits uh, over a hundred thousand dollars one month and following that because there's so many units we're going to get uh, plumbing and electrical you know the utilities are, are gonna those those services though there'll be more permits coming into the next year so that's a positive one one negative uh, on fees not a not a real negative but just to be be aware that there's a you know a slight decrease in fees but that's mainly because <laughs> we allocated 25 percent of I think the uh, parking fees or, or uh, that go towards uh, police uh, equipment uh, so that you know because it goes to a revolving fund it no longer shows up in the in the general fund um, then uh, I, I have yep president Hay has a question yeah, yeah just uh, if you said that for the um, Board of Health yep. you, you had budgeted 1.4 Four zero, yeah. Four zero, yep. and and you're you're taking in approximately one point six, and then you said and we're budgeting the same for next year. One point six. So, right. It it does show on the. Uh, okay. I'm and sorry. I, I want to clarify that. Yeah. For, for me, I heard we're budgeting the same means we're budgeting the one point four yep. again, but instead we're budgeting the one point six. So we're we're taking extra revenue that we're getting. Right. Which exceeded the what was projected. Right. And we're putting that in, and it's not necessarily for a one-time only item. I mean, I'd rather we not spend it at all. But if we're going to spend it, to spend it for a one-time item, I can I can justify. But to just put ex excess money that we get beyond projections into the budget for things that go across the board, which are raises and for, uh, for extra positions and those types of things that just doesn't make sense to me in the long run I think you know that's why we end up on this treadmill and um, needing to generate more revenue all the time well the the only thing is on the, that particular item uh, those revenues are expected to continue so it's not a one-time receipt the uh, this beneficial use program is new and it, it's it's something for the future so it you know at least it's something that is going to sustain it's something that we can hope we can will sustain right yeah good point i mean uh it is a, it is a, it's a not an easy uh, oh, and, 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 right. and but, Dick, i understand the difficulty yeah. that you people have with projecting revenue uh, you know absolutely it's it's not a, a, a tied 
true method and in it, it, it's hard. But, so, but sometimes I just prefer that we erred on the side of caution than erring on the side of hopefulness. If, if Thank you, you. If you're not sure about what revenues you're going to get, you don't use it. And we're using it. Because as it was stated earlier, it's difficult to balance the budget without it. Well, it's only difficult to balance it if you don't make any cuts. Uh, Councillor Bezel. Um, I, I have to agree with the other councillors on this. To me, a budget process is uh, not spending everything that you get in. A budget process is when you look at what your uh, projected expenses are going to be um, and you stick to that. And if there's extra money left over, uh, you, you spend it on uh, things maybe to improve the city. So, for example, um, if we had $500,000 and we wanted to, to pave more roads, or we had $500,000 and we wanted to use that money to fix a roof that's going to last 20 years, um, I think that's the best way of spending our funds and not just saying, well, because we're fortunate that Great Wolf came in this year, we have an extra $500,000 to spend on something that may be a recurring expense year after year. So I think when we're looking at this, the recurring expenses need to be broken out and those need to be budgeted based upon uh, actual or realistic numbers uh, and everyone gets a percent. So for example, if, if we have this extra funds, use it for stuff that we can use to actually rebuild our infrastructure or fix facilities that we have, something that we're going to get long-term use out of so that someday we're not scrambling and saying we have to start using our reserve fund because the roof on the senior center needs to be done and we don't have the money in the budget for it. Thank you. Gentlemen, please continue. Yep. Um, that, on the revenue side, um, that was that was pretty much uh, what we had, um, but uh, I, I would like to we could highlight a few of the expense items. That can I just ask yep, Sarah sure. some before you do that? I mean, without going into all of that, I mean, yep. where does the city fall right now on with two months to go? I mean, where do we see our position in terms of available funds at the end of the year? I mean, are we, are we seeing? Revenues exceeding expenses again, and and is it going to be robust as it normally is, uh, more than it usually is, or not as robust? I mean, you covered the revenues very extensively. What about the expenses now in terms of overall? Are we right. Oh, well, are there any big uh, big items we should be aware of that may yeah, drive I, that number? Yeah, you never want to try to predict available funds, but um, um, we're we're having a typical year. It may not be as great. I mean, we as Calvin pointed out, we we've, we've had a very good year with tax title licenses and permits and, and a few others. Um, uh, people are are spending within their means. There are a few that that'll be coming back. Um, right now, our available funds is down to about a hundred hundred twenty thousand. Um, if you consider the uh, the damage claim uh, at the uh, senior center. Um, the uh, a couple of accounts that are doing well. There aren't there aren't many, but uh, the debt, the treasurer's debt account. Uh, we we always try to be conservative with that, uh, and we're not issuing bonds this year. We plan to issue bonds next uh, next June, so there's fewer fees that we have to pay. Uh, so there'll be a little bit of money in that account. Uh, uh, let's see. The uh, one thing to note on the law department uh, that deductible for twenty-five thousand that we've noted on the available funds that relates to the <coughs> the uh, the damage claim at the senior center. And just so you know, the insurance uh, provider Meyer is is has a uh, they're carrying a two hundred thousand dollar reserve for the damage at that facility, but they're going to take care of that claim. Okay. Um, the building department, uh, there are a few, uh, there was a demolition, there's money left over in that account, and a few other items that related to the new and the old city hall that um, 
we have to have a meeting with the mayor and um, and building department to go over what we're going to do with the remainder. If and, and I think some of that will be closed out, so that'll help uh, with your revenues. Uh, snow and ice. There's a deficit, as you know, of two hundred forty thousand. Um, we were hoping to transfer all of that to FEMA MEMA for a grant, but um, the latest information is uh, um, in talking with the chief and and the FEMA. FEMA director uh, Libertori that we may not get we may get about a hundred 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 sixty thousand so we may have to make up that difference uh, with the available funds from this year it is always better that not to carry over deficit although they the state is allowing us to do that it's just we have means to, to cover the two hundred forty thousand we'll find a way to do that it just taints the, the, the financials, and it's something that we have to explain to the auditors and to Moody's and the, and the outside. So you don't want to go there if you don't have to. Um, other accounts are doing well. Uh, some accounts that were involved, were involved with group uh, on the uh, be employee benefits, one very positive is the health insurance is doing very well. Um, and, and what happened there was uh, there was quite a bit that happened in that account. We eliminated the Fallon plan and we had the cha a change in the Medics 2 program, which Calvin and the mayor headed up with the PEC. Uh, this program uh, saved the, the retirees' money and the city money. Um, how, and, much, and it, how, much, how much is the pension account up next year? It's up 600000 And that, that'll run... Uh, Till 2032, and that it'll increase? be fully funded. That increase about 550,000 is to the city per year increase. Right, and then, that, and, then that that, and then that amount will drop from 16 to 17 million down to four million. If we increase that account 600,000, well, we do every that year. funding. Okay. So I mean, there, there's a door open for the future uh, to help address OPEP, but. Okay. Um, that this resulted in major savings uh, to the city, um, uh, but so so what we are. But on the other hand, whenever you save money, uh, you have to share that with the schools. So uh, it it increases our unfunded or our net school spending for them. So uh, this year we will be coming forward with a, a transfer from the health insurance account uh, for for the school department. And also, there's a couple of other accounts, the employers, FICA, and other benefits that will need a little bit of money. The FICA was cut a little bit, um, so we'll be coming in for, for that. Um, but I, I, I'm going to start. But the reserve for the OPEB, because this, 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 is, this is significant in that it, it, it reduced this, the payment by the retirees and the city for the their retirement for their for their health insurance by 30 percent so that we talked to our actuary and that should help reduce our our liability by by about that amount and for that population and that is a significant reduction in the millions we'll know the amount when when we have the actuary done in the fall so the charge that we've had we we haven't had the money to put in but we are going to Hopefully, come through with the two hundred and fifty thousand to get something in the uh, in the pot this year, <coughs> and we've always looked at plan de redesign or design. So, um, and and I am going to defer to Calvin to this is this is uh, last, you, last year with the when we were negotiating with the PEC, uh, we went from a Medex three plan for the Medicare eligible retirees to a Medex two with a prescription drug Medicare supplement. Which reduced the the cost of the uh, premium uh, by about a third, a little over a third, and it's that's the savings that was shared by both the employees and the city. The uh, uh, em retirees uh, saved about just over five hundred dollars a year in premiums for their health insurance, and the city uh, saved substantially, and that that's why there's been such a savings in uh, this year's budget. Um, as well as having an impact on the OPEB liability, uh, both because you're looking at what the projected costs are for retirees, 
And so we're not only, <coughs> we're starting with a lower starting point. So the increases are not only smaller because you're starting with a smaller amount, but they're starting lower down. And that affects the liability. Is it a fair, fair statement that that number could go back up? That number would go up if the premiums go up. What about if we added more people? Or if you add more people. And the liability that we owe currently is like 110 million. Okay. I thought it was 170, 179. Isn't 170. that with pension though? No. That that 179 right. is just the health care. Right. And that okay. that is if we were not in a funding plan. If you go to a funding plan, it will right. uh, adjust, but that would take years to get. So is it your gentleman's opinion though that we should be putting something away every year into that account? Because right now we have nothing. Right. There, I guess I would answer you that there are two ways to address the liability. And one is to put money in, which is what's being suggested. And the other way is to take steps to lower the liability by lowering what the projected cost is. Could you do be. both? Well, that's what that's we're, what we're that doing. Would, yes. Okay. We're, we're, we're doing and one strongly and the other we're, we're, try, we're taking baby steps on. Very, yeah. very tiny baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Mr. Sarah, wait, yeah, I'd just like to go back before we get too far. Um, Dick, just a couple of minutes ago, yep. you mentioned about the $250,000. Right. You're saying that you, you're hoping that we'll put that into OPEB. Trust. The trust. Take, right, it's in the reserve. We would come back to council transferring it from the reserve to the OPEP trust. Okay, but we're not putting anything into OPEB in this year's budget for the draft that we have. No, I think the, as we did last year, it, the order came from available funds. So we're hoping that we have some money left over and then, right. we, then we might put it in. Okay, right. thank you. The, uh, the other thing that caution um, the, is when you put it to OPEB, you don't get credit towards uh, net school spending, which is, that's more of an immediate problem than for, you know, so that's another thing you got to grapple with. Can, okay. can you gentlemen explain very quickly if you can, because I get people commenting all the time, some counselors about why are we harping on OPEB, who cares about OPEB, the whole state's got problems, the whole country's got problems, We're waiting for the state to bail us out, this, that, and the other thing making people like myself who are drumming home the warning signs that we should be concerned about owing 180 million that we have not one penny saved for. Can you explain why this is a concern all of a sudden? Why the state's focusing on I guess explain to the public into the why is this important to be concerned about? Why should we <coughs> because for some reason there's still those that believe it's not happening anytime soon, so why are we so scared about it right now? I mean, I, th I think what's driving it is the, is the bond market, the financial markets, because they're recognizing that, I don't, and I'm going to say the city, but it's all, go all municipalities, all states, everywhere across the country, have this liability that no one has addressed. The fact that the, that the city has promised retirees health insurance benefits and hasn't put a dime aside to, to pay for it. Uh, so it's a pay-as-you-go system. It's a pay-as-you-go yeah. system currently. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, back in the mid-'80s, passed legislation that required funding of pension liability. And so Mass you know, when we went through the last uh, economic downturn and stuff, the Massachusetts pension system was never really in jeopardy the way New Jersey might have been or Illinois might have been or California might have been because the money's been put aside. It's just been in the last few years few years, maybe 10 years, that this OPEB liability has been brought up, again, driven by the financial markets that are saying, gee, if we're, uh, the financial markets are trying to com measure uh, municipalities in the same way they look at corporations. And I mean, it, it, it's tough because municipalities aren't corporations. I mean, we're, we function as businesses, but it's, it's different because we have the power to tax and, and, and we operate a little bit differently. Uh, but that's what's driving it. And, and, and as part of that now, when we uh, talk to Moody's or Standards and Poor's to try and get bond ratings for our, for our bond issues, uh, they ask about OPEB and funding and what are we doing. And initially it was, you know, are you talking about it? Yes, we're talking about it. Now they're looking to see, are you putting money in? Do you have a plan? What kind of a plan do you have and so on? And so they are uh, looking at that, and the the better your plan or the or the uh, more you're putting in, 
uh, the better your rating is, which translates into lower interest rates. It, I think that's what's driving it. Yeah, it's a it's an accounting standard for governments that came into play. A, um, I don't know about ten years ago. It it started. It it came up, and uh, and they want to see you making progress. Before, when it first came up, they wanted to know if you have a an amount. So that's about eight years ago we, we had the actuary and now they want to see what you're doing to fund. Many communities are putting in small amounts, half a million or million dollars, uh, and then they're building from there. Um, I, I think it, it's great that we, you know, will be start putting money in and also the, 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 um, the plan uh, impl implementing changes that are going to save us significant dollars. Um, but this this one because because this change is is tied to retirees that and that's what drives this liability. It's significant, and and you're right. It could it's going to change, but that's why we have an actuary done every two years. Um, the uh, the other area I just wanted to mention was the schools. Um, we've been rerunning numbers, and and we do uh, need to f give them more money. A couple of factors: the transportation costs that they pay out of their budget, we do not get credit towards net school spending, and that cost has gone up. Um, the other big factor is health insurance, because that cost went down. We we have to share that cost with them. It we don't demonstrate where our our effort is is as high. Um, and then next year, um, because of uh, our revenue growth on our local level. Uh, the Chapter 70 money, usually the Chapter 70 money, which shows on the, it went up like 270000 or 290000 in the governor's budget, but the net school spending amount went up a million dollars. So uh, they may need the money, but it, it just makes it that much harder to, to uh, demonstrate that we've given the schools all, all that we have to. President Hay? Yep. Hey, Dick, you just mentioned that the transportation for the school department, which it is ludicrous that that does not count towards net school spending, but that's a whole different topic for, for a different day. But you, you just said the transportation costs went up. With the decrease in, in gasoline prices over, over the last year, you would think that those contracts should actually go down unless we're adding hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids or hundreds of buses in, in different. How, how's that going up it, when, when, the, when the cost to operate it is going down? Significantly, um, it it was bid, uh, and um, uh, it, I think it was, might have been a f three or a five year bid. I don't I don't know, um, but um, um, so I you know if you already bid it and the the price of gas goes down, I don't think there's an adjustment in the uh, in the contract for that. I don't. Who, I'm who not determines aware. whether it's a three or a five year bid? I would think the schools between the schools and the uh, in the city purchasing, or the, I would think the schools would drive that. And if it requires a council approval, I know sometimes if it's more than three years, it goes to council. But has, I don't. I assume has, that has anybody done any research to determine what what's advantageous to us, whether to have a short one or, or a longer period with that fluctuation of gas prices, so that we can maybe do it in our best interest. I, I assume they do that and because they probably can compare what others are paying per bus. I, I think it's per bus per day. Uh, the other thing is half of the cost, it's almost $5 million, okay? And, and let me just say that about 12 years ago, the state used to pay us 30% on the cherry sheet for that cost. So we didn't, we, they said, well, we're paying you. Now we don't get that. Mm -hmm. But we're still subject to Prop 2 and a half. So, so you know, you got all these, uh, all these uh, items working against you know, working yeah. against you. Um, um, so the, the half of the cost uh, deals with special ed? Right. Okay. okay. Council Krishmar? If I could just push you a little bit further on the, the net school spending, you, you've mentioned a few times, yep. you know, there's going to be additional costs coming at us or additional funds that we'll have right. to pull from, from available funds. Do, do we have a general sense, just estimated ballpark at this point? Um, I. I would think uh, at least we're going to hopefully provide an order for 300000 for this year, transferring from health insurance to the schools. Okay. Uh, they're determining whether or not they need money for this fiscal year or next, and they need money for next year, too. So you get a feeling that $300,000 will satisfy net schools? No, and then next year we're going to need to 
we'll, we'll need to give them more. And, and let me just say that the position we have is unique from other communities because most communities uh, f more than fund the schools or they, they have overrides or whatever. So the, we're in the minority where we, we just try to, we're trying to balance everybody and it's, it's a struggle. Now, it, it, Councilor Di Natale had asked you previously about uh, available funds, and you said, you know, looking at MEMA, FEMA might only end up being a one, was it uh, $1.2 million allocation? Is that? No, uh, the, the, uh, the FEMA MEMA money would only be, would, uh, is, is there to cover the uh, 240000 shortfall in the snow and ice. I mean, if we get 160,000, which is what we may get, then we may go to the, uh, you know, available funds. So there'll, there'll probably be no available funds left at the end of the year. But we'll be closing out some uh, so even positive addition, revenue numbers, and and there's some spending that even with the addition of the 160 that we may get from FEMA MEMA, that would only cover, so that that, that wouldn't cover all of the snow okay. and ice. And, and we may get more snow and ice. We, you know, we have had snow in May. So <laughs> that's happened. Don't say that. So, I know. So for net school spending, yep. we know the number we owe the schools before the fiscal year starts, correct? Uh, we have an amount, yes. And we continuously underfund that number. Is yeah. that not correct? Right. We, You know, the, the whole... Uh, it's kind of one-sided. If you overfund them, you can't get the money back, and nothing against both sides. But so uh, traditionally, we may be short a couple hundred thousand, and and then we monitor it during the year. Well, during this year, we monitored, and then we saw all of the surplus in the health insurance, and then we we realized we have to give them at least half of that too. I understand that. Okay, but, but what, what concerns me is is this this mentality that we take a wait and see approach. Mm -hmm. It may work three or four consecutive years, but I always wonder what happens if in the next year it doesn't work. If, for example, if we underfund the schools 300,000 at the start of the year, and then we monitor all the accounts, and we don't have the money available to give them that 300,000 at the end of the year, that then rolls into the next year. Yep. And it, so Mike, Mike, I know we've been able to get by and, and we haven't had any issues, but I guess I'm a very, conservative pr person in terms of not a risk taker I I just feel like there's no finality in policy it's just we're gonna give you this and then we're gonna do a wait-and-see approach to make sure to, to you know because you mentioned earlier if we give them what the number is that they ask for they could potentially get more than what they actually spent understood but if we gave them that number we wouldn't know anything correct we wouldn't have to worry about any free cash at the end of the year. My, my, my point, Dick, is it sounds like we're underfunding the schools and taking that wait-and-see approach because, back to the earlier comments, we don't have that money to give them because we have to pay for stuff on our end. So we're taking a wait-and-see approach on free cash, and then out of the free cash we give them whatever's out of there because we're not going to touch any of our operating expense accounts on our side. Isn't that not what's going on here? I mean, uh, and it works so far. A little far, bit, but, but uh, there's other moving parts, and they're, they're major. Adult, like school choice, that's another um, item that changes. We won't even know that till the end of May for this year. So kids coming and going, we get revenue in that goes to them in a special revenue account, but if they go out, we get charged, and that's the charge that... Uh, Council, you would ask me about on the cherry. Maybe I'm getting. And let me this, let me just say this: net school spending is 62 million plus for next year, and the budget is 108 million, and that 62 million doesn't cover transportation, which is another five million. Okay. So it just gives you an idea of how maybe, much. Maybe I'm getting cute with this um, question, but and, and, and it, you get 62 million, 67 million to play with, and you, we're trying to get it down to 300 thousand. If if so we're gonna a, we're gonna underfund them by 300k or 250 every now and then, what? Why not underfund them by 25 thousand? I mean, as low as small, close as we can get without hitting that number. So we're not overpaying. I mean, right. I feel like if we did 300 thousand, we still may be overpaying them. That that's a possibility, right? So I guess I guess it's it's not a yeah. def definite science. We could give them another million. Uh, yeah, you, I, you know we we're, we're trying as best we can, yeah. and and when you're trying to deal with that, and then are you going to put a lot of money into OPEB and not fund net school spending? 
it, it's just it, it just feels it's a, a little different lot of, when there's you're, a lot of budgeting when practices you're a, we're when doing you're on here. That side of the fence. I, I understand that, but That's the, when I, you're the mayor and you're on our side trying to balance, it's a little different. I, I, I I'm well aware of budgeting practice and policies in my own private work experience. I I understand that nothing's a definitive science, but it sounds to me like more and more we keep taking a hail mary approach to what might what might occur at the end of the year to then cover what we didn't do at the start of the year, and that may work over time but I just get nervous that eventually we're going to reach a point where that's not going to work and we're going to be in big trouble and, well, the, and the the mayor's already said uh, our first uh, attempt to to uh, address the school uh, available funds will come come out of uh, will go to the schools okay and, or or if you make some cuts okay with the budget All right you know it's is there anything else gentlemen on this uh, anybody, just, uh, uh, Council Kushmark, you have another question? Just, just two items that I, I wasn't sure on that weren't necessarily self-explanatory. The um, just rentals and mill number eight. Uh, could you just explain? Sure. Um, the rentals are just there's two. Uh, a one of the uh, recycling companies rents some land. I think there's a lease of land uh, with the health department. <coughs> okay. Uh, and then there's. Uh, a Verizon lease that we have uh, where they use a tower. They have a tower uh, that is handled through, I believe it's DPW. And then the mill number. The mill number eight is basically a um, tax increment financing agreement with okay. mill number eight, where it was negotiated years ago that they would, in addition to any, um, in addition to the calculation, uh, they would give us $25,000. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate the time. Thank you, uh, councilors. The last item we'll take up this evening is I was asked by a member of the committee uh, to bring this back before the committee for further discussion, and it's order thirty-five fifteen, transferring forty-two thousand five hundred to information technology expenses from reserve for other municipal purposes. Uh, President Hay and then Council Kushmark. Talk about holding your nose and voting for something. Um, this has more issues and, and more problems in, in my estimation than almost anything that's come before us in a long time. But unfortunately, since I am, have been an advocate for um, an economic development person to be hired and that has been done, I can't expect that person to do their job without this tool. Um, so I will be supporting this tonight so that the economic development director has a web page that is usable for them in their efforts to um, bring economic viability to the city of Fitchburg. I still have great concerns about the structure of the department and who's in charge and who's responsible and all of the things that I've gone over ad nauseum, but um, I'll, I'll vote for this tonight, but it's certainly issues that still need to be addressed. Thank you. Council Kushmark. Uh, I had asked this order to come back in front of us for, for two reasons. One is is one that uh, Councillor Hay just, just spoke of. We just hired an economic development director. We've spent years uh, discussing economic development and, and, and filling that position with the, with the right person and, and making sure we're setting them up for success, um, and I think we'd be setting them up fundamentally for failure if we didn't give them any tools uh, necessary to succeed. I mean, we talk all the time about digital presence and, and web presence, um, and you know, all too often that's how people are, are looking at the city. They're looking at it either through digital or they're looking at it physically. Um, we're a known commodity in North Central Massachusetts, but if anyone from the outside is looking at at, at you know, at coming in or, or looking at any possible opportunities, um, you know, our, our, our web presence is pathetic right now. Um, we need to give uh, our economic development director uh, and that department the, the, the tools necessary to succeed. Um, because we're not pleased necessarily with the, uh, the current state of affairs from IT and, and the management of our current website, um, I don't think we should hold hostage some of the other departments um, that, that could benefit immensely from uh, a new website. Um, secondly, over the past 
you know, 18 months, we've discussed marketing uh, of our city. How do we talk about ourselves? How do we present ourselves? How do we change the perception of the city? Um, I know Councillor Beazall and, and myself have put in a couple of different petitions at aiming at you know, how do you bring in revenue that could, that could sustain some marketing efforts. Um, and all of those, those have failed. We around the council have, have openly, many have openly agreed that um, we need to do a better job with marketing ourselves. Uh, I was up at the Highlands today, um, and just just when I walked outside, you saw this beautiful view of the city. Um, you know, rolling hills, you see straight through to Hollis Hill Farms. You're driving through the city around today, it's spring approach. It, you realize it is a beautiful city that we're in, um, but. Right now, the perception does not equal that reality. Um, we have beautiful city. We have, you know, some departments that do a great job in the city, um, and that, that can that can do a tremendous job to help our, our residents both day to day and in the long term. And and we're not accurately portraying that through our digital web presence. Um, and at some point, we have to invest in that. Um, realizing we need to improve in the administration area, we still at some point need to invest, and then and then hold accountable. Uh, right now, we have a terrible tool and you know, to, to ask someone to then go and spend, or, or to, to spend a lot of time and effort investing in a, a, a poor piece of equipment that we currently have would be foolish. I think you know, at some point we need to invest, give people the tools necessary to succeed, um, and, and start marketing the city and, and trying to change the perception uh, to, you know, to, to equal the reality uh, of our city. Thank you. Uh, for me, I will not be supporting this. And it's frustrating for me to hear committee members and counselors talk about the fact that we need to give our departments the tools to do what they need to do. It's important to put this whole issue into context. I came on the council seven and a half years ago. The website then was not user friendly. The website today is not user friendly. Nothing's changed since I've been on there. Links are broken. Information's not up to date. People are not clear as to who's responsible for what. And the IT director is passing the buck. So nothing's changed in eight years. And now all of a sudden, and after eight years, we're told, well, it's not the processes or the people. It's the system. One counselor who's not here this evening asked a very good question at the first meeting on this. They said, well, you can put a new website in place, but you still need someone to monitor the content. You still need someone to monitor uh, anything that's broken. You still need someone to coordinate how it gets updated. You still need someone to build it. If we continue the same procedures in place, and I know we got some policy a few weeks ago. My, I am not trying to be negative here. I am going on experience from my own eyes. When I go on the website, there are empty pages, there are broken links, there are links that go to inappropriate sites. Why does it take me to find that problem? I'm not trying to be negative here, ladies and gentlemen. We, to me, I'm not convinced that it's the system that's the problem. Until I see this website, because no one's been able to tell me, well, we can't update the current website. We can't, because when I ask them to fix a link, they fix it. When I ask them to change something on the page, they change it. So where is the system the problem? I was told the system is the primary problem because it's not auto-monitoring. It's not checking every day to see what's broken or what's missing. Well, it can check what's broken, but it's not going to check what's missing. It's not going to check what's up to date or not up to date. You still need people to monitor that. So until I have assurances that there is a process in place and there is understanding across departments of what is expected of them, we can put $50,000 towards a new website, but I don't know if anybody in this room has any confidence whatsoever that this is going to run smoothly just because it looks better. And now we have the economic development director here, and I sympathize with her position as well as the others in this room that say we need to give her the tools to market the city better. My issue is... Why don't we look at what's currently not working and ask ourselves, is it because the website system is bad or is it because we're not doing it properly? It is always easy to point the finger and say, and we hear this all the time, well, it's not working because the system's bad. It's not working because I need four more people in my office. I'm tired of the excuses. And now we're going to spend 50 grand to fix something that doesn't fix the problems we've experienced. 
And all the problems that I have experienced are user, experience, user error, operator error. It's not system related. When you go on a web page and you click on 30 some odd links that don't work, that's not because the website's bad. It's because someone who's monitoring it or some, some people who are supposed to monitor it aren't monitoring it. So I will not support this. I would prefer that we wait uh, until we see the processes and the training and the, the, the web page itself get better and then I can build my confidence into saying, okay, the underpinnings of this website have now been fixed that a system cannot correct. Now let's upgrade with the times. We're putting the cart before the horse here in my opinion. We're updating a system before we update the processes and procedures. I don't think we should be doing that because no one in this room has any confidence it's going to work well. So why then am I I'm asking everybody, why would you vote for this if you aren't very confident or you don't know it's going to be maintained properly? Shouldn't we make sure that that happens first before we spend 50 grand? I'm not uh, criticizing the administration for putting this forward. I certainly think IT infrastructure is a capital improvement request that we def we should we should um, we should review from time to time, but we've got to put this model in context. This is before it's not because the system is old and outdated and we're not having any more services on it or anything. It's because of what we've been harping on for years about this website. And this is the solution we're told is the, is the answer to the problem when none of us in this room are convinced of that because of our own experiences, not because we have any personal vendettas or anything. Until I am shown empirical evidence that that website is maintained and updated properly. I will not support spending tens of thousands of dollars to fix something that I am not convinced is the core problem here. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on 3515? Move 3515 be adopted. Second. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to adopt 3515. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? One in opposition. Passes four to one. Move we'll adjourn. Second. Motion made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you.